Guys, there's an ambulance with sirens coming. Watch how Tesla FSD handles it better than a human. Look, the light turns green, but FSD spots the ambulance and doesn't move. This human driver drives right in front of the ambulance. FSD proceeds once the ambulance clears. Perfect, great job, Tesla. But at the supercharger, we have the Cybertruck as well. <laughs> this is a trip, and this guy right here is the cool one getting to drive it right now. So yeah, take a look at that. 50,000 supercharger with the Cybertruck that we get to see for the first time in person. Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patrons, Stephen S., Tommy T., and Randy S., Thank you for choosing to support the channel. So how about that FSD beta clip and its handling of an emergency vehicle? Let's not overreact to just one anecdote, but with all of the negative press over the past few months of how Teslas interact with emergency vehicles, a clip to keep in mind to maybe share to counter some of those points, it's not all bad. That was also a pretty cool example of how Tesla's FSD was actually better than the human in that instance. They saw it, whereas the driver next to them clearly did not. Over the weekend, if you're a Tesla stockholder, you may have received an email with regard to an upcoming settlement situation. The notice was just to let Tesla stockholders of a certain record date know that there will be a settlement hearing on October 13th that they could attend and be heard if they wanted to. However, I'm sharing this because it could have implications to Tesla's financials in the near term. This is set to be one of the final steps in this case that we talked about earlier this year where Tesla's board of directors agreed to settle by basically giving back $735 million worth of Tesla stock incentives. As part of this settlement, Tesla's board of directors can give this compensation back in three forms, cash, unexercised stock options or Tesla stock. Clearly this settlement offer still needs to be approved. However, it's a very unique situation. So the question becomes how will Tesla's financials be impacted by this event? Briefly, I spoke to an accounting friend of mine and this was just his guess. So please do not take this as gospel or what's going to happen. It's just a possible outcome. With that said, you could guess that Tesla could reduce its compensation expense by that $735 million since that's the value that they'll be getting back. The thing is, this amount is not what Tesla charged to stock-based compensation when these options were originally issued. His guess was that Tesla originally recorded between one and $200 million for these stock options, but it's hard to know for sure. So there's a chance with Tesla's Q3 or Q4 financial financials, we could see SGNA decrease by around one to $200 million. But again, none of this is a guarantee. I really just wanted to plant the seeds to give us something to keep an eye on when it comes to Tesla's Q3 and 4 financials. The main takeaway, this settlement could provide a slight boost to Tesla's financials sometime over the next few quarters. This is an excerpt from Elon's biography. I just took a screenshot of my Kindle version. Here's what we have. Elon was convinced bad drivers rather than bad software were the main reason for most of the accidents when talking about autopilot. At one meeting, Elon suggested using data collected from the car's cameras, one of which was inside the car and focused on the driver to prove when there was driver error. One of the women at the table pushed back. We went back and forth with the privacy team about it. We can't associate the selfie streams to a specific vehicle, even when there's a crash, or at least that's the guidance from our lawyers. Elon didn't love that. The concept of privacy teams did not warm his heart. He said, I'm the decision maker at this company, not the privacy team. I don't even know who they are. They're so private, you never know who they are. He continued, perhaps we can have a pop-up where we tell people that if they use FSD, we'll collect data in the event of a crash. Would that be okay? The woman thought about it and nodded. As long as we're communicating it to customers, I think we're okay with that. So we have those two simple stories now being used and twisted from sources like Electric saying that Elon wanted to use Tesla cameras to spy on drivers and win autopilot lawsuits. That really just feels like a mischaracterization of the situation because don't forget, it's mainly the regulators and NHTSA who have been pushing Tesla for those interior cabin cameras in the first place. So one, Tesla was essentially required to have that camera in the first place. And then two, the fact that Elon would want to use that data in the event of a crash to protect Tesla from frivolous lawsuits 
I don't personally think that's a bad thing. Now, yes, it's true that some Tesla employees were apparently using some of this data improperly, not just in the event of a crash, but hopefully that's a one-time incident. Tesla has handled it and fingers crossed it does not happen again. But to spread the message that Elon is trying to spy on drivers just seems ridiculous. Clearly as Tesla grows, it's going to need to be able to protect itself. Some of you will remember in that Top Gear episode when they reviewed the Tesla Roadster, they said that the batteries on it quickly drained and it suffered mechanical problems. Then in response to that, Tesla was able to provide data logs, which led both to revealing in statements to the media, the cars did not in fact break down and never went below 20% state of charge. Or how about that time AXA Insurance admitted faking a Tesla battery fire in a crash test? saying not only was the fire staged using pyrotechnics, but Tesla did not have its battery pack or high voltage systems on board. And for anyone out there that has questions or concerns about how Tesla is collecting and using your data, they're actually pretty thorough on their own site. So again, I will link this below if you want to learn more. So no, Elon is not trying to spy on you. He's just trying to protect Tesla from these ridiculous lawsuits that have already come and will continue to come. Over the weekend, I came across this image of this latch looking device on the new Tesla Model 3 that is on all four doors. Doing a bit of digging, it seems like these are to improve the crash worthiness. Easiest way to think about it is that door structure can then engage with the lower sill of the car so it can help to distribute energy in the event of a side crash incident. There's certainly some conflicting information out there, but it seems like this possibly could be to prevent the door from caving in or moving significantly out of alignment when you get T-boned. Please correct me if any of you have more definitive data on this, but I didn't see anyone else talking about it, so I wanted to pass it along. As far as I can tell, this isn't something revolutionary that only Tesla is doing. I believe other automakers are implementing design features like this. On X, Tesla said, this week we produced our five millionth car. Thank you Tesla owners for your ongoing support. Then on Weibo, Grace Tao Lin said, this new pearl white version of the Model 3 officially rolled off the assembly line in Shanghai as that number five million. From a blank canvas to today's five millionth car, Tesla has always adhered to a simple and efficient approach. Outline a blueprint for a sustainable future. Here's the image that she shared. Now, in case you're thinking, well, Dylan, Tesla produced the first Roadster in 2008, so it's taken them about 15 years to produce five million cars. And that is true, but as always, context matters. How about March 9th, 2020, Elon said, congrats Tesla team, on making their one millionth car cumulatively. So Tesla went from zero to one million in about 12 years, and then went from one million to five million in about three years. And then doing some simple math, if you go back to when Tesla hit the four millionth car produced, that was March 1st of this year. So fast forward about six and a half months, to when Tesla just now hit that 5 million number. This is what we mean when we talk about exponential S-curve production. It took Tesla 12 years for that first 1 million, and most recently, it took Tesla roughly half of one year to produce 1 million vehicles. And the fact that they wanna compare it to how, how pitiful Tesla pays their workers and other companies pay their workers, that's what this whole argument's about. Workers in this country gotta decide if they want a better life for themselves, instead of scraping to get by paycheck to paycheck while everybody else walks away with the loot. Yeah. And you know, when we bargain good contracts, going back to the founding of this union, people join the UAW because we set the standard. People mm -hmm. join unions because they, it's a better way of life. And that's what we gotta do. We have to bargain a good contract, and then we're gonna go organize these yeah. places and, and bring these workers in so they get their fair share of the economy that they get nothing of right now. Most of these workers in those companies are scraping to get by so that greedy CEOs and greedy people like Elon Musk can build more rocket ships and shoot themselves in outer space. And that's unacceptable. Even the Wall Street Journal is waking up to what's going on. They said any wage increase further advances Tesla's already tremendous cost advantage in EVs over its older US peers, which are contending with generations of legacy expenses while trying to steer a costly transition to electric cars. And Tesla's current cost advantage is before the next gen platform that's supposed to be 50% cheaper. This compensation discrepancy conversation has gotten out of control. Here's what we have. The Detroit company 
company's labor costs, including wages and benefits, are estimated at an average of $66 an hour. And they're saying that compares with Tesla at $45 an hour. The problem is people are taking these two data points and acting as if it's apples to apples when it's really not because we know Tesla has significant stock-based compensation that does not have a direct cash cost to Tesla, meaning it would not be included in the wages and benefits category. Either way though, Wells Fargo has estimated if the Detroit Big Three were to meet all of Sean Fain and the UAW's demands, it would boost the average hourly labor cost to $136. I did just want to remind everybody, March of last year on X, Elon said, by the way, Tesla factory worker compensation is the highest in the auto industry. Ford has said the union's demands would more than double Ford's current UAW related labor costs, which are already significantly higher than the labor costs of Tesla, Toyota, and other foreign owned automakers in the US. On Friday, we talked about Ford laying off 600 workers who were not striking, and over the weekend, we learned they have told 2,000 workers at a Kansas car plant their factory would likely be shut down this week for lack of parts. Negotiations have been continuing over the weekend. Sean Fain said, we're not going to wreck the economy. The truth is we are going to wreck the billionaire economy. One of the biggest things to watch will be how these automakers handle the two tier wage system. That's one of the biggest points of contention in this whole thing. So far, none of the Detroit three have proposed eliminating those tiered wage systems, but they have offered to cut the time needed to reach top pay to four from eight years. A professor at Cornell said the UAW appears to be focusing its demands. You're no longer hearing anything about the 32 hour work week from the UAW. This was a good post from Chamath. He said the unions have decided to cut their nose off to spite their face. This labor deal, if it happens, will destroy the legacy OEM automakers. Their only paths out would be to automate and replace unionized people with robots or de-unionize. Neither are possible. So if this plan gets implemented, expect the automakers to bleed money. This is the tipping point towards structural long-term insolvency. And I don't see how the capital markets will allow these OEMs to raise long-term capital without paying exorbitant rates. On top of this, the demand risk for these OEMs is that hyper-automated, non-unionized competitors like Tesla can now completely run away with the car market because they will be able to aggressively lower prices while Ford, Stellantis, etc. will be forced to raise prices to pay for this labor deal. I, I would argue that it, they're looking at Tesla. Uh, you know, Tesla absolutely, is the absolutely. elephant in the room at the bargaining table, right? Yeah. The, the automakers need to figure out how to compete with them. Tesla is already just hammering Detroit with these price cuts on their electric vehicles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They have margins that are much richer than the Detroit automakers, and they're already using that as a weapon. If you put Detroit at more of a disadvantage, it really, really yeah. will hurt. On the other hand, the union has not succeeded in organizing Tesla. And what most people don't know is that the UAW represents I believe it's 46% of all auto workers. They do not control the auto worker, you know, uh, right. labor. Right. And it's hard to have leverage when you don't have the majority. And I think they need to work on organizing as well. A former GM executive has said there's just nothing to suggest the strike is going to end anytime sooner than Halloween. That's when the membership starts getting antsy about being out of work. How many offers do you think it's going to take? And at 20 percent, how much higher can you go? Well, I, I think we have a very generous offer on the table right now. It's historic. From a wage increase perspective, it's the most significant offer we've had on the table in our 115-year history. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to bargain in the press, but, uh, you know, we need to get there fast because uh, this is not good for our employees. It's not good for the communities, their families. And for every GM job, there's six other jobs in the economy that depend on uh, depend on us running. So we got to get back to work. On this situation, S&P Global Mobility estimates the combined impact could be about 3,200 units per day. And listen to this. Before the strike was actually going on, S&P Global Mobility's light vehicle production forecast had combined production at the three plants where the strikes are taking place 
to already decline 17% compared to last year. Ford, GM, and Stellantis combined accounted for 49% of US light vehicle production in 2022, which is why although this might not be the most exciting of topics, it's worth keeping up with because it has huge implications for the auto market. Another storyline to watch, an executive director from S&P said a prolonged labor dispute could cause irreparable damage to an already fragile supply base, weathering numerous challenges. Suppliers are dealing with higher interest rates, extreme labor inflation, fluctuating vehicle demand, and the need to invest in electrified propulsion. Supplier viability is a major concern. On that point, just today, a contract manufacturing supplier is now planning to lay off 293 employees, about 60 miles miles north of Detroit thanks to the UAW strikes. The latest update we have, Sean Fain has said that they remain far apart on contract agreements. I don't really want to say we're closer. And he declined to say when he might announce a second wave of plans to join the strike. The UAW has resumed talks with GM on Sunday and will do so with Stellantis and Ford today on Monday. As if that's not bad enough, these big three are also set to enter contract negotiations in Canada as they're set to be in the midst negotiating new deals with the Canadian Union, Unifor, and Ford will be first up in these negotiations with Unifor. So far, they did not come close to meeting our expectations. The current deal between the union and the automakers is set to expire tonight at midnight. Last month, the Unifor bargaining committee received overwhelming support for a strike with 98.9% of its 5,700 members voting in favor of that action. For now, though, that would only affect Ford. Unifor extended its contracts with Stellantis and GM to focus on hammering out a new three-year deal with Ford before moving on to the other two. Over the weekend, Tesla got some free advertising with the number three trending video on all of YouTube already getting 66 million views. And yes, the Tesla Model X makes an early appearance. To avoid any copyright situations with the music, there was just a brief clip of the Tesla FSD, hands-free, pedal-free driving. And then of course they did an acceleration test where everybody got launched backwards. Esther has shared some images. The first V4 supercharger in Spain is about to open. This marks the 10th location globally for V4 supercharging locations. Hope you guys all know I have zero political agenda or angle here, I don't do politics, just sharing the data. On Friday, Trump said the all-electric car is a disaster for both the UAW and the American consumer. They'll all be built in China, they're too expensive, don't go far enough, take too long to charge, and pose various dangers under certain atmospheric conditions. If this happens, the UAW will be wiped out along with all other auto workers in the United States. The all-electric car policy is about as dumb as open borders and no voter ID. It's a complete and total disaster. This seemed like a questionable article, perhaps because of the translation, but the simple takeaway, it sounds like Tesla may be increasing its relationship with TSMC to get more production of its Dojo D1 chip over the next few years. Tesla is sprinting towards the layout of its supercomputer dojo. It's rumored it will expand its cooperation with TSMC. Tesla's D1 chip is produced using TSMC's seven nanometer process. Next year, the volume of wafers produced by TSMC is expected to be higher. This year, it's doubled to 10,000 pieces and orders will continue to increase in 2025. Either way with this one, it definitely lines up with Tesla doing whatever it can to increase its compute power. Turkey's President Tayyip Erdogan asked Elon Musk to build a Tesla factory in Turkey, according to Turkish officials on Monday. The country's communications directorate said the Tesla CEO told Erdogan many of the country's suppliers already worked with Tesla. He also said Turkey was one of the most important candidates for its next factory. The news was reported by Anadolu Agency, which said Erdogan and Musk spoke during a meeting at Turkish House in New York. It also said Erdogan invited Musk to attend Turkish Aerospace and Technology Festival Technofest at the end of September. It cited Musk as saying he would gladly attend. Musk said in May that Tesla would probably pick a location for a new factory by the end of this year.
As you can see right now, Tesla doesn't really have that much of a presence in Turkey. Auto Evolution reporting the Model 3 and the Model Y are at the top of the list of the least stolen vehicles. Consumer Reports crunched the numbers collected by the Highway Loss Data Institute between 2020 and 2022. Listen to this though, just last year, over 1 million cars were stolen in the United States. Looking around, just a fun fact, Hellcats are far and away the most stolen car in North America. So hopefully the criminals out there are waking up to the fact that Teslas will oftentimes catch you. Whether it's the cameras, sentry mode, the GPS features, the mobile app, there are many ways to find someone if your Tesla is stolen. The Wall Street Journal shared this article, Tesla in Saudi Arabia in early talks for an EV factory. But Elon then shared this article saying yet another utterly false article from the Wall Street Journal. Journal. Not a Tesla app has shared some images from update 2023.32 showing us improvements to the rear camera view. First, they said the post processing has been enhanced, which leads to a much clearer image. They also changed the crop factor so you can no longer see parts of the bumper or parts of the trunk. From the Japan news, the Chinese government is unofficially instructing its EV makers to use domestically produced electronic components, including semiconductors. China is aiming to establish a self-sufficient supply chain for EVs, which means Japanese, US, and European parts manufacturers are highly likely to be excluded from supplying Chinese EV makers in the future. They're also calling for setting targets for the proportion of domestically produced parts used in EVs if automakers fail to meet these targets, they may be subject to penalties. And they said the instruction was given verbally by the former minister to leave no evidence of the exclusion of foreign firms. <laughs> I don't think that's gonna pan out too well. Over the weekend, we got some new images of GM's upcoming Cadillac Celestic. These images were captured in downtown Vancouver. This car has a base price of around $300,000. Some folks were trying to look at data on the screen to draw conclusions, but given that this is a prototype, I would not go too far. But there you have it. The Tesla Model 3 is the first electric vehicle to break into the top 10 least models in the United States. The Model 3 ranked 7th on the list, representing 1.79% of leased new vehicles in the second quarter. One in four of the roughly 42,000 new retail Model 3s to hit the road last quarter was leased. Here's the list of the top 10, and the Ford F-150 is number one. Good to see an EV crack this list, and it makes sense Tesla comes out with new technology so frequently that leasing one, especially as people get their feet wet with EVs, definitely makes some sense. Stellantis has finally revealed their EV plans. The redesigned Fiat 500e, already on sale in Europe, will launch in the United States early 2024. The 1500 REV pickup will be late 2024, an electric Chrysler crossover arrives 2025, and a mid-size Ram pickup with an electric variant could emerge in 2026. Ram's CEO said the cost of electrification is expensive, so for sure we need to make sure that we protect the profitability of our current ICE business to help fund the transition to electrification. And they said Alfa Romeo will go fully electric by 2027 and Chrysler by 2028. Just a quick hat tip to Polestar, we have PC Mag reporting that for batteries in the Polestar 2, Right now, Polestar is working with this company, Circular, who uses blockchain technology to track cobalt and mica. And then for the upcoming Polestar 3, it'll also trace lithium and nickel. Circular is also working for VW, Mercedes, and Volvo. Let's contextualize here and understand that this is still nowhere near Tesla's level of intricacy and transparency with things like its 2022 impact report. But for the competition to actually be spending time working on bringing more transparency to the supply chain and helping educate customers, allowing them to see what's going on and where these batteries are made is a good endeavor that should at the very least be on all of our radars. We got a new study from Recurrent Auto that was looking at Tesla Model Ys for 2020 model year. They're showing us the average range score for Teslas owned and operated in cold and marine climate zones are higher than for those Teslas owned and operated in hot climate zones. This range score 
is just how much of the original vehicle's range is still expected today. So Model Ys owned and operated in colder climates had range scores of 95, and in hotter climates, it was down to 92. They said the generally accepted threshold for accelerated battery degradation is around 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Just keep in mind, these results can easily be skewed by how owners are handling and operating their vehicles, regardless of which climate they're in driving habits, charging habits, storing habits, and everything else. But the simple takeaway, it's the hotter temperatures that could lead to a bit more of battery degradation. Tesla North America said, all Hertz rentals in the United States will now allow full Tesla app access. This means you can use keyless lock and unlock via your phone key, remotely precondition the cabin, track your charge status, and more, a feature many people have been waiting for. At factories in Japan, Toyota has turned to self-propelled assembly lines, massive die casting, and even old-fashioned hand polishing as it aims to make up for lost ground in BEVs. Toyota believes it can close the gap with Tesla and others by combining new technology with the famous lean production methods it has used for decades to wring inefficiency, including excess costs, out of manufacturing. After a recent factory tour, they were apparently showing off techniques like making high gloss bumpers without any paint, the mold is hand polished to a mirror finish, giving the bumper its luster. Also, 30 year old equipment used to process parts can now be run at night and on weekends after being automated through robotics and 3D modeling. Their chief product officer said the strength of Toyota's manufacturing lies in our ability to respond to changing times. On those self propelled lines, it's where EVs are guided by sensors through the assembly line. This removes the need for conveyor equipment, a major expense in the car assembly process. Process. In a demonstration, EVs inched along without a roof, allowing parts to be slotted in. A robot arm lowered car seats into the EV bed. Toyota also showed off a prototype of the die casting technology known as gigacasting. Like Tesla, Toyota says it'll produce EVs in modular sections, reducing parts. And they're saying they developed molds that can be quickly replaced, which is periodically necessary. Toyota says it reduces the time to change the mold to 20 minutes versus 24 hours normally. They've also introduced a self-driving transport robot that ferries new vehicles across a 40,000 square meter parking lot, a job that was done by drivers before. The automaker said it aims to have 10 of these robots operating by next year and will consider other plants after. Could also sell these robots to other companies. What we have here is Toyota doing factory tours to try to spin the media narrative that it is now leading the way in EV innovation. As we just heard though, everything they're talking about really is in prototype testing phase. However, things like not using paint, gigacast, modular assembly, automating assembly lines, None of that is innovative or revolutionary at all. It's literally just copying Tesla's playbook. I'm sure they have their own spin on things, but Toyota has given us too many false promises over the years. So this seems like a poor attempt to try to spin that narrative. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. You can find me on X linked below. Please like the video if you did. And a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.